Well, last night was yet another Democratic presidential debate. Welcome to Real News. I'm Mark Steiner. Good to have you all with us. Last night's debate was pretty white, and these debates can become repetitive. But the larger question is, beyond this and what we saw last night or didn't watch, if you didn't watch, what do they tell us about the state of the Democratic Party and the 2020 election that is looming in front of us? An election that some say may be the most important election of the last century. We just watched a British election where most people loved Labour's platform but voted for the right wing. What does that say for what the United States might be facing? We're joined once again by Bill Fletcher Jr., who is a racial justice, labor, and international activist, author of They're Bankrupting Us and 20 Other Myths About Unions and Solidarity Divided, and his latest work, The Man Who Fell from the Sky. Bill, welcome. Good to have you back. Thanks, Mark. I'm glad to be back. Let, 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 me, let me just start with this. This was, um, and I, I, you know, I think one of the glaring things for some people Mm -hmm. was that um, there was only one person of color on the stage, and that was Andrew Yang. Mm -hmm. He was asked right. this question. This was his response. Mr. Yang, a new question. The Democratic Party relies on black, Hispanic, and Asian voters, but you are the only candidate of color on the stage tonight, and the entire field remains overwhelmingly white. What message do you think this sends to voters of color? Why am I the lone candidate of color on this stage Fewer than 5% of Americans donate to political campaigns. You know what you need to donate to political campaigns? Disposable income. The way we fix it, the way we fix this is we take Martin Luther King's message of a guaranteed minimum income, a freedom dividend of $1,000 a month for all Americans. I guarantee if we had a freedom dividend of $1,000 a month, I would not be the only candidate of color on this stage tonight. I'm not quite sure that's why there are fewer people of color on the stage, but that's an interesting answer, and people do love to hear him. So what's your knowledge? How important is that? What, what, what did that say to America and to communities of color around the country? This is a, this is a tough question, Mark, because um, the, the way I look at it is, is this. You, you started with a very big field, and in that field, the of the uh, candidates of color, in my opinion, there was only one that was progressive, and that's Who Julian that? Castro. Julian Castro. Okay. Uh -huh. um, I think that uh, Kamala Harris, Booker, Tulsi Gabbard, are at best inconsistently progressive. Mm -hmm. So I wasn't looking just to have representation, racial representation. Um, I'm looking for the politics and the people that uh, not simply look like me, but represent the politics of racial justice and, 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 uh, and the represent the politics of economic justice, et cetera. So it's not surprising. I mean, I think that part of what Yang was raising, the first part, was, was a good point, which is that um, uh, US elections depend on financial contributions. Um, and, you know, uh, candidates of color in general are going to be coming from behind the curve. Um, now, there's a separate issue about whether or not the standards that were set by the DNC for this debate should have been altered so that you had greater diversity. Um, maybe. I mean, it's not the main thing that I'm focusing on, Mark. So what's the main thing you're focusing on? The politics, who can kick Trump in his rear decisively and lead and inspire a whole set of, um, not just a whole generation, but inspire uh, down ballot candidates. And, you know, I, I'm still a, a Bernie fan. And I, I am, uh, I'm not opposed to, uh, you know, um, I, well, let me put it in a different way. I'm going to vote for whichever Democrat receives the nomination because we have to remove Trump from office. But the person that I think will inspire the most is Sanders. And I think that Warren is a very good candidate. Um, I wish that Julian Castro uh, had more um, energy behind him. Uh, but perhaps he would be a great vice presidential candidate. But I, I'm looking at the politics, Mark. That's what I want to know. I want to know who's going to take this country in a different direction. 
So when let's take let's pick up on that for just a moment before we watch mm -hmm. this other clip. Um, th th that seems to me the biggest question as I was watching the end of the debate and the clips earlier this morning before I came in in, in here to the studio. That you know when I, I interviewed Rachel Shabi earlier today, um, who writes for the Nation, and she's. Uh, a, a British commentator, and we were talking about the, the, the election that just happened and what that says for the future and what it may say about the elections that the United States is facing. One of the things that Rachel was commenting on was that all of Labour's positions were the most popular positions among the British electorate at large, all sectors. But they voted right and went mm -hmm. right. So, I mean, that to me was a bigger warning sign than Labour losing itself and how they lost and Corbyn and all the other arguments I'm going to make about Corbyn and Sanders. Those weren't the issues to me, but that particular fact was glaring to me. How does that play out here, do you think, or does it? Well, I have to give you two answers. So one is that we have to be very careful about what conclusions we draw about the United States from the British elections. Uh, one of the hu huge things in the British election was Brexit. Yeah. And I think that there's every reason to believe that Brexit fatigue absolutely affected the election, that the conservatives were targeted like a guided missile on that question, whereas Labour had good platforms, but a very um, ob obscure message. The other thing that strikes me, which I think is, is relevant to the United States, though, is that, um, it, that in order to win, you need to build a broad united front. And it's not clear to me that Corbyn was really out there building that kind of united front in order to defeat the conservatives. Um, that's a lesson that is directly applicable here, uh, that there's going to be a lot of middle forces that are going to be ambivalent up until election day. And we've got to have a broad tent. And that means that our message and our narrative, our storyline has to be clear and has to be compelling, but not milk toast. And what I worry about from the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, and the, the leadership of the, of the Democratic establishment is that their conclusion from Britain is that we need milk toast. We need a milk toast candidate who is not going to piss anybody off who will reach the so-called middle, right? As opposed to understanding that what we need is someone that is gonna inspire the base and, and that that inspiration will become contagious. So, I mean, and I think that, that that's clear. The question of people argue about who that candidate is and many people think it's Bernie, some people think it's other folks. Um, but, and, and there was an interesting interchange. Um, one was between Buttigieg and Warren. And mm -hmm. I think it goes to the heart of the question of money and politics and also is how this might play out in a larger sense. And the other one was Warren's quick answer when they asked her about uh, taxing the wealthy. But let's, let's look at the Buttigieg-Warren thing first, and look, just for a second. The mayor just recently had a fundraiser that was held in a wine cave full of crystals and served $900 a bottle wine. Um, think about who comes to that. He had promised that every fundraiser he would do would be open door but this one was closed door. We made the decision many years ago that rich people in smoke-filled rooms would not pick the next president of the United States. Billionaires in wine caves should not pick the next president of the United States. Mr. Mayor, your okay. response. You know, okay. according to Forbes magazine, I am the, literally the only person on this stage who's not a millionaire or a billionaire. So if... This is important. This is the problem with issuing purity tests you cannot yourself pass. <laughs> Good response. Um, so this becomes part of the issue of money in this election and how they play this, I don't know. Um, I just want to play one more little piece here, then we'll leap into what this, how this may affect the election. This is a mm -hmm. question that Elizabeth, uh, that Warren was asked uh, about the taxation on wealth. Every candidate on the stage has proposed tax increases on the wealthy. <clears throat> but you have especially ambitious plans that apart from health care would hike taxes an additional eight trillion dollars over the decade. How do you answer top economists who say taxes of this magnitude would stifle growth and investment? Oh, they're just wrong. <laughs> <laughs> I 
I love that answer. I do too. That was a great yeah. answer. This is wrong. That's right. That's right. <laughs> no, no. I think it's very important because what what a lot of people forget, <clears throat> excuse me, is how heavily the rich and corporations were taxed after World War II and into the 1950s and early 60s. And it was during that time that the economy was booming. Um, and, and we forget that and act as if none of that ever happened. Um, and there's still this, this peculiar belief uh, out there of, of a trickle down economics. And I think that that's part of what's going on. But you know, see, Mark, here's the thing, in terms of the first exchange, this is my concern. Um, Buttigieg is basically right in this sense that we live in a place, a country where elections um, are, are by and large able to be moved based on the money the, P, the candidates are able to get in. There are certain exceptional circumstances, um, but they, they, people need money, they need a lot of money. And this is not just the presidential elections. There was a point when I was going to run back in 1989 in Boston for state representative, and the amount of money yeah. that I would have needed was prohibitive. It was just, it was obscene. So I think that arguing over this is wrong, that the argument needs to be about the how do elections get financed, as well as how long an election season we should have. Both of those things. That's what I wish that Buttigieg and Warren were really arguing about. Now, if she wants to make an argument that he is being corrupted and we can demonstrate that, well, that's one thing we should we should take on. But but it 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 feels to me that it's missing the point. It's not just about an individual statement by a candidate about where they're getting money. It's about what is their stand on the financing of elections. And do you think that's important to people at large? Um, I think part of what's important to people at large is that we're in a permanent election cycle. And, and this relates to uh, something about the debate. We're in a permanent election cycle where it's like this stuff never ends. And because it never ends, the candidates always have to be raising money. And that means that increasing, they'll hit up a lot of small donors, but they have to hit major donors. And this becomes a lot of their time. I've spoken with Congress people about how they spend their time and the amount of time that they spend raising money is obscene when they're supposed to be governing, right? Now, so I think that for regular people, yes, this does matter. The other part of it, Mark, is this. This may sound like a tangent, but forgive me. It's all right, go ahead. The, these debates, I think that the first debate was fine. That the problem is that after debate number one, and this is not just true in this election cycle, the debates become redundant. We by and large don't learn much more about the candidate that we didn't know from the first debate. Some points are, are underlined. And I think that there needs to be a very different format, either with, the, with just one topic or preferably where you have something like a meet the press format, where you have a candidate that is interviewed, subjected to an in-depth interview by multiple journalists, where you are, they are asked hard questions. And you have that maybe for an hour each. My guess is that people would watch something like that because that's where you start to learn more about not simply the debating style, but you learn something about what does this person think? How do they respond to certain kinds of pressure? What happens when someone comes back at them, you know, and pushes them? These are the things that I would like to see. I didn't feel like I learned anything new right. last night. I, I agree. I agree. I, I think that the, the one person that... Um, much of the center is pushing hard and the establishment is pushing hard uh, is Vice President Biden. And yes. um, they see him as the only person to take on Trump. We'll talk about that after we watch this clip as we conclude. But this is Biden being pushed on the Afghan papers. Mm -hmm. As Vice President, what did you know about the state of the war? And do you believe that you were honest with the American people about it? The reason I can speak to this, it's well known. If any of you followed it, my view on Afghanistan. 
I was sent by the president before we got sworn in to Afghanistan to come back with a report. I said there was no comprehensive policy available. And then I got in a big fight for a long time with the Pentagon because I strongly opposed the nation building notion we set about. Rebuilding that country as a, as a whole nation is beyond our capacity. I, Mr. Biden, the question was about your time in the White House, though. And I'm in talking that, about the White House. In that Washington Post report, there's a senior national security official who said that there was constant pressure from the Obama White House to produce figures showing the troop surge was working, and I'm quoting from the report here, despite hard evidence to the contrary. I'm the guy from the beginning who argued that it was a big, big mistake to surge forces to Afghanistan, period. We should not have done it. I'm the guy. One of his favorite lines. I'm the guy, but but I so see here we have I'm directly flying in the face of what the post printed right. um, and what was going on. But this is the person who's supposed to carry the fight forward. And he should have started by saying, you know what, we were wrong. Right. If he had said that, he would have shaken the room. The reverberations would have been felt in Moscow, right? We were wrong, right? Because then people are willing to listen. What he was basically saying is that while everyone else was doing the wrong thing, he was the one that was, you know, doing the clarion call to try to uh, bring people back to the truth. And while that there's a possibility that that was the case, the point was that he was part of an administration. He was number two. He needed to say to everyone last night, we were wrong. We were wrong. We were dead wrong. We made a mistake. And here's the lessons that we can learn from the debacle in Afghanistan. He had said something like that. Hey, man, I think a lot of people would be listening to him. So finally, let me get your final thoughts here on just, I know you're not prescient, none of us are, <laughs> but what may be this- Don't be so sure. <laughs> I'm getting scared now. So, I <laughs> <laughs> so, so I mean, we're, we're talking about what, what this tells us about what we're, what's being faced by this country in this 2020 election. A lot of people are talking about Trump is going to win. A lot of analysts are saying there's no way to stop him. The Democrats cannot pull themselves together to do it. What are your thoughts? Oh, it's absurd. He can definitely be defeated. I, I mean, the, the thing, you know, it really bothers me, uh, all of these uh, uh, predictions here 11 months in advance, um, and their predictions based on on a, an assumption that we're in a normal situation, and we're not. We have never had in office uh, since perhaps the 19th century someone who was a wahoo like this guy, and where we have this <clears throat> um, very energized right-wing populist movement, and we have a very energized opposition to this guy. So that even though there might be people that under other circumstances would say, well, you know, the economy's doing pretty good, which is really an overstatement. And, and so I'll go for this. No, the, the corruption of this administration, uh, the racism and misogynism has all kinds of people energized. And that's what we've got to keep in mind. Um, so this is an unusual situation. It's an extraordinary situation. And, and what this really will come down to is the extent to which the Democrats are successful in mobilizing their base. The people who decided to sit out 2016 because they thought there was no difference between Trump and Hillary, most of them, I would argue, no better this time. The question is whether they can and will get to the polls. So no, I think it's wrong to make this assumption that right. This guy has it. No, I, I, that's a very important and powerful point, you know, between what we saw today with Christianity Today coming out against Trump, uh, the Billy Graham newspaper was founded right. by Billy Graham, calling him immoral. Uh, mm -hmm. That's a big piece of, of what people need to think about and how you get back those 8 million voters who did not, who voted for Obama and did not vote in that last, in this last election. Right. That's, right. Those are critical pieces. Bill Fletcher Jr., that'll be the topic for the next time. And uh, thank you so much for joining right. us. Pleasure. Thank you. And I'm Mark Stoney here for The Real News Network. Thank you all. Let us know what you think. Take care. Have a great holiday. Thanks a lot for watching. Appreciate it. Uh, but do us one more solemn favor. Hit the subscribe button below. You know you want to. Stay up on our videos.